Okay, 11-3, let's talk about hearing and auditory processing, how all of that works. So of course, what is hearing? It is the transformation of sound waves, uh, pressure differentials in the, in, the, um, in the gaseous environment around us or aqueous environment around us uh, that are transduced from that mechanical stimulation to a neural uh, uh, depolarization and uh, propagation. And so there's a mechanical process that goes on and there's a neural process that goes on. And uh, we have anatomical and, and neurological structures at each one of these stages uh, to uh, transform and classify this information uh, into ways that our cortex responds to. So we'll talk about that whole process and all of the anatomy involved as we go through this lecture. So of course we have an outer ear uh, called the pina. Uh, has various different locations, uh, regions, a helix, antihelix, tragus, and the antitragus uh, here, uh, or the antitragus and the, the tragus uh, is what I'm pointing to on my ear. Uh, we have a uh, tympanic membrane that separates the outer ear from the middle ear. The middle ear is the uh, mechanical amplification part, so it has the malleus, in incus, and stapes, miss, malleus, incus, and stapes, and the movements of those um, ossicles magnify the movement of the tympanic membrane 20 times. So um, via the, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, which are the Latinate terms uh, used. And so the inner ear is where that mechanical uh, propagation gets transferred into a neural stimulation in the uh, cochlea. Uh, via cranial nerve 8 is how that propagation uh, goes back to our brain stem and up our brain stem. <clears throat> so if you look in the otoscopic view uh, through the outer ear at the tympanic membrane, then you can see these various different structures. Uh, you can see the uh, ombus portion of the, um, the malleus uh, with the tympanic membrane surrounding it. You can see the reflection of the light here showing that concavity to the tympanic membrane. Uh, but with a middle ear infection or fluid in the ear, um, uh, the otis media effusion, then you can actually see through that transparent, uh, translucent tympanic membrane to see that fluid built up uh, depending on... So here we have a fluid, here we have... Um, the uh, kind of um, mucus pus components, varying degrees of inflammation or um, uh, fluid buildup in the middle ear via this otoscopic view. So uh, here's that tympanic membrane with the sound waves approaching it. Different frequencies of sound waves all hit the tympanic membrane and cause it to move uh, in these various patterns as these sound waves build up. Uh, so that is propagated via the movement through the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or the stapes, which the stapes is located in the oval window of the cochlea. So those sound waves get transmitted through the fluid of the vestibular duct through this spiral cochlear, uh, cochlea in the middle ear, uh, and uh, again then get transmitted back through the tympanic duct, uh, and there's a small round window with connective tissue over it, which releases uh, the uh, or dampens that sound wave propagation so that new sound waves uh, can propagate at different frequencies and, and patterns. Between the vestibular and the tympanic duct is the cochlear duct. The cochlear duct is where the hair cells are located, and it is filled with what's called endolymph, which um, is a high uh, electrolytic uh, ion concentrated fluid for the purpose of um, facilitating the depolarization of these structures. <clears throat> so we can see here a cross section through the cochlea, so not only, so it looks like a snail's shell, so it's spiraled, but it's also a spiral pyramid heading toward the apex of the cochlea where that uh, vestibular duct inf inverts onto the tympanic duct. Uh, so there we see the vestibular duct and the tympanic ducts uh, in their same color uh, coating. And we can see 
uh, within the, uh, the uh, cochlear duct, we can see the organ of corti and the, um, um, oh, what's it called? The, um, uh, I'll, I'll get it in a second. Uh, so, but uh, close to the organ of corti are the ganglia, uh, the um, uh, analogous to the dorsal root ganglia, um, the spiral ganglia, and their peripheral processes synapse on the sensory receptor, which is the hair cell. And so those hair cells respond to um, the mechanical movement, uh, their mechanical movement to cause that depolarization. Uh, okay, so here it is, tectorial membrane, uh, uh, tympanic membrane. Tectorial membrane is a, a connective tissue outcropping from the ossicle in the center of the cochlea. And that tectorial membrane doesn't move, it's stationary. But the hair cells of the organ of corti uh, are attached to it. Uh, so that those apical uh, processes of the hair cells are embedded within, uh, so the apical processes are, are attached to the tectorial membrane uh, and their um, basal lateral portion is embedded in the organ of corti and that basilar membrane. And so their processes are extending uh, centrally through the uh, cochlear, gang the spiral ganglion, uh, to form uh, cranial nerve 8, the, the cochlear portion of cranial nerve 8. So all of these inner ear structures, of course, have to have uh, a blood supply. So here it is. Um, uh, just uh, This is for your information, the basilar artery, the anterior uh, inferior cerebellar branch of basilar artery. Uh, is supplying the uh, cochlea. So, uh, and these are very small branches, so as we age over time, our blood supply uh, to these structures around the ossicle degenerate, and uh, that's one way that we can lose hair cells and lose hearing at certain frequencies. So each hair cell um, is basically responsible for detection of a given frequency. And so uh, we can see here now that organ of corti, where the hair cells are located uh, within the sustentacular cells, uh, their processes, apical processes attached to the tectorial membrane. And so there is a tonotopy uh, to this structure. The basilar membrane is actually the portion that's going to move, and it's going to move those embedded hair cells within the organ of corti. The tectorial membrane does not move. It is stiff and rigid connective tissue. And so this basilar membrane is moving as these frequency sound waves are pulsing the fluid within uh, the cavity. Uh, and so um, this basilar membrane is thicker or thinner in different locations. At the apex, it is thinnest. And at the base, it is the, um, the uh, thickest. And so you need high energy to move a thick basilar membrane. So high energy correlates to high frequency. And so high frequencies uh, move the basilar membrane the most at the thick base. Low frequencies move the thinner basilar membrane the most at the apex. So there is a tonotopy within this spiral uh, cochlea. And so each hair cell is going to, uh, it, the hair cell is not detecting the frequency. The movement of the basilar membrane is, depending the, is, is dependent upon the frequency. But if you lose hair cells within one particular portion of the cochlea, then you lose reactivity, responsiveness to a particular frequency. And so uh, this can happen with aging as our perfusion of the organ of corti decreases. Uh, and the result is uh, ringing in the ears. So the ringing in your ears that you hear at a particular frequency is a given hair cell dying as it has lost its oxygen and glucose. So it's 
dysregulating its uh, its its uh, action potential, uh, its it activity, and so you're hearing a ringing sound at a given frequency, based on where that hair cell is uh, along the uh, cochlea. So here I've, I'm showing you numerous different pictures, drawings, images of the tonotopy and how that works. So we can see here that this basilar membrane is what is moving with the different frequencies of sound waves that are traveling through it. And we can see that at the apex, at the helicotrema, uh, we have the apex, we have a, uh, a, a high frequency, uh, uh, we have a low frequency detection of sound at the apex. At the base, by the round window, we have a, a um, higher frequency detection of sound based on the movement of that basilar membrane. Um, so yeah, there you, there you have it. That is tonotopy and how uh, that mechanical movement is transferred into a neuronal depolarization or electrical uh, current. So uh, here we have those spiral ganglia, we have the peripheral process to those hair cells in the organ of Corti. We have the central process forming the cochlear portion of the vestibulocochlear cranial nerve 8. Those enter the brain cell, uh, the uh, brain stem, uh, and synapse on the cochlear nuclei. Uh, the cochlear nuclei, uh, here we have a ventral and a dorsal cochlear nuclei, and these have different functionalities. They, have, they process different types of information from the hair cells, from the, the ganglia. And so uh, the ventral uh, cochlear nucleus is responsible for localizing the sound you hear from one ear or the other ear. Uh, so for that reason, ventral cochlear nucleus sends bilateral projections up the spinal cord. You can see here the bilateral red fibers going up the spinal cord, uh, the uh, brainstem. Uh, then we have the dorsal cochlear nucleus, which is responsible for categorizing or discrimination of types of sounds. And so that information is heading up contralaterally to the contralateral side. So now these slides are gonna be moving up the brainstem. So here we have uh, that uh, that um, that uh, me medullary portion of the brain stem with the uh, cochlear nuclei. That information is traveling up, and the information from the uh, vestibular cochlear or ventral cochlear nucleus uh, travels to the superior olivary nuclei bilaterally from each ear bilaterally. The uh, superior olivary nucleus uh, is then. Uh, checking for differences in the same signals. So it checks for differences in the timing of the signal. So if uh, information uh, gets to one uh, superior ol olivary nucleus and then it gets to the other one shortly thereafter, then it's saying, oh, the information coming from this ear got there sooner, so it's closer to this ear. It also listens for differences in intensity of these signals. So the louder the signal is, the more likely it is that that's closer to this, the ear it's coming from. Uh, no, of, of course, it uses both of these um, modalities of information to determine localization because things can reflect and amplify in our environment and that can confuse this process of localization. So it has to use uh, various modalities. The dorsal cochlear nucleus for sound discrimination ascends uh, past superior olivary nucleus without synapsing because superior olivary nucleus is not having anything to do with uh, categorization of sounds, just the localization of the sounds based on their timing and intensity. Uh, so um, the superior olivary nucleus though, it's, it's detecting information about the intensity of the sound. So this initial processing area is where we have this reflex to dampen sounds uh, that are entering our inner ear. And so the superior olivary nucleus dampens sounds by triggering uh, facial and trigeminal. And remember, trigeminal is doing, is, is innervating uh, tensor tympani. So tensor tympani uh, 
is attached to the malleus. And so tensor tympani can pull on the malleus and thus uh, restrict its movement and pull it away from the tympanic membrane and dampen sounds in that way. Stapedius from facial is attached to the stapes ossicle and in that way can restrict its movement in the oval window. And so this happens when we're talking, when we're chewing, uh, because those sounds are so loud through our um, uh, auditory tube uh, that it causes intense movement of our tympanic membrane. And so whenever we're talking, uh, we have to activate these muscles to reduce that sound. If there's lesions to superior olivary nucleus, then that can lead to sensitivity to sound, where sound becomes painful. And so these people don't want to talk as much. They uh, shy away from sounds. Uh, so this is called hyperacusis, which can ultimately lead to damage to the hair cells from overactivation, leading to loss of hearing. Uh, so something to be aware of. So moving on from superior olivary nucleus, uh, that information about sound localization and the information of discrimination from the dorsal cochlear nucleus ascends to the inferior colliculus. So this is the first place where both of those modalities of sound information gets processed. And so this uh, inferior colliculus shares that information contralaterally, but also ascends and exits to the uh, medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So here we have that information heading up to the uh, medial geniculate nucleus. MGN then sends that information to the primary auditory cortex, 41 and 42, uh, where we um, then process that information about tonality, timbre, frequency, location, and, and then associate that information to the different cortices. So the primary, 41 and 42, and the primary um, cortical auditory cortex, associates that information with Wernicke's area when timbres and frequencies associated with voice are identified in the primary auditory cortex. And then that voice information uh, gets processed. Am I hearing words is what the uh, Wernicke's area basically does. It says, is this sound, which has the timbre and tone of a voice, is it speaking words? And then it decodes those words with uh, input from the temporal cortex and your somatic memory. Um, uh, so um, here is, so that auditory pathway we just talked about, here it is uh, in one page. Uh, so all of the tracts, the lateral lemniscus for, formed from those ascending fibers from superior olivary nucleus and dorsal cochlear nucleus. Um, you've got, um, you know, the all of the different orders of neurons from the uh, cochlear, the spiral ganglion, onto the uh, MGN and the auditory cortex. Uh, so this is, you know, the the one page you can form your notes from. Now, um, of course, all of us have probably experienced the auditory uh, acoustic startle reflex where a sound causes us to direct our gaze and move our heads in a particular direction, causes us to jump and startle. And so that all occurs, much like the superior uh, colliculus for vision, in the inferior colliculus for sound. And actually, the inferior colliculus sends that startle information. Uh, so this is before the auditory cortex. This is before our conscious processing of sound has occurred. The inferior colliculus says to the superior colliculus, something startling has entered uh, my awareness, and so I need to direct my gaze and my, um, my neck musculature to point my head toward where I think that um, startling trigger uh, stimulation has occurred. So inferior colliculus talks to superior colliculus, causes eye movement through the... Uh, tectospinal tracts uh, down to the musculature for neck movement. So that is the acoustic startle reflex. And so in a nutshell, that is auditory processing from the mechanical to the neural pathways. I hope you enjoyed listening.